Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome on this chilly Sunday morning to the uh, NRF Summit. 35,000 attendees here, unbelievable. Uh, you know, the, I guess the, the rumors of retail being dead may be uh, a little overblown. If, if we get so many people to come uh, on a long weekend to New York City to study retail. And so I'm here to talk to you about um, the sins that are being committed. Uh, it is Sunday and I'm talking about sins and sinners. I am not an ordained minister, so don't worry, I will not sermonize. I may preach a little, but um, I will not sermonize for you. So what I wanna talk about is the winners and losers um, in the industry today. And, and we read about a lot of losers. Um, thousands of stores closing, uh, uh, retail chains going out of business, consolidation on the supplier side, um, quality issues on the supplier side, lots of bad news. And so why is that? Why, why are we facing such tough news? And at Damon, we believe there are seven reasons why, seven self-inflicted reasons why there is such bad news. And there's a way to overcome that. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you today. Um, hopefully, what we can do is work on together on redemption of these sins. And so the, the, the seven sins are uh, brand pride, price envy, uh, national brand wrath, quality lust, margin greed, promotion gluttony, and assortment sloth. And let me talk through each of these sins and the redemption that exists within them. Now, my lens, so you all know, my bias is in the private brand side of the business. That's what Damon does. Damon has been around for 50 years. We work with retailers and manufacturers to build private brands and then help market them um, in stores. So that is our focus. The examples I will use will be around that to, to, to a large degree. Um, but I'll step outside of our specific area and talk about some other examples. So the first sin, brand pride. You know, if, if, if you're too proud, what that means is it means that you're tone deaf to what others um, believe. You think you have all the answers and that others don't. That leads to what? That leads to irrelevance. So if you're tone deaf, you become irrelevant. Man, we can see that happening in the marketplace. We can see that happening with um, 8,000 stores closing just in the last quarter. We can see that with 22 retailers declaring chapter 11. We can see that with the consolidation that's going on. So there is a lot of pride leading to irrelevance going on. I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, the first example comes from 10 years ago, but I, I love this example um, because it does speak to, um, get to make fun of the British a little bit, who we know is a proud culture. Um, so the Brits came to America and spent $2 billion to launch a, lo a chain of stores called Fresh and Easy. They built these stores out mainly in California, so they picked one of the toughest markets, and they opened up several hundred without doing much market research and without understanding the American consumer. They lost $2 billion on this effort. Unbelievable um, the, 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 the hubris that, that went into this, the tone deafness. More recently, as you all know, Target um, went to Canada, spent several billion dollars, and then had to close down in the Canadian market. They thought they knew the Canadian business because they saw Canadians coming across the border shopping at Targets, and so they just exported the Target footprint to Canada. 
didn't work. So there are a bunch of these that happen. You all know, of course, um, the, the hubris that goes on at Sears. You know, the greatest, the greatest retailer ever uh, 50 years ago, and now, you know, on the cusp of going out of business. What, what's fascinating, we were watching a story play out at Sears a couple years ago where Sears decided to convert um, several um, Kmarts over to what they call these Sears Essentials stores because they believed internally that Sears had a better, more powerful, more relevant name than Kmart. So when you're picking from two weak choices, you probably aren't going to succeed. You know, the, 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 the Henry Ford quote, which I love, the, um, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me to give them a faster horse. Um, you know, meaning, don't talk to people, just come up with the answer yourself. And Steve Jobs at Apple, who did not believe in too much market research, that's all well and good, and those guys were visionaries and all. In today's world, that doesn't work. Ignoring the consumer, believing that your brand and that your company has all the answers and will be attractive, obviously doesn't work. I'll give you a little bitty example that I experienced myself uh, on this subject. So Walmart owns Sam's Clubs. You've seen what they've been through recently, closing the Sam's Clubs down. Their private label line is a, is a brand, quote unquote, called Sam's Choice. They decided to spice up that brand and come out with a subline of Sam's Choice called Sam's Choice Italia. So they took a very weak brand in Sam's Choice and then added an irrelevant subname to it and launched a bunch of products under the Sam's Choice Italia name. In fact, they rebranded some of the Sam's Choice items, pizzas. And I'll read you what a, what a consumer said about this. Uh, I like buying the Sam's Choice pizza. It's a great pizza. However, I just bought one last night. The box has changed along with the design of the label, and y'all have stamped Italia on it, plus added an extra dollar to the price. And it's a smaller pizza. Big disappointment, Walmart, big, two thumbs down. So, and this is on social media. So again, the hubris of having a brand that you think is powerful that may not be powerful is a sin. Um, and the, you know, the sincerity part needs to be built. Um, we believe that being sincere, having some humility is the right answer in today's world. Having all the answers doesn't work. So having some humility does. Uh, there's, a, there's a chain in, in Great Britain, um, and I don't mean to pick on the English um, over and over again, but I kind of will. Um, but these guys did it right, ASDA, and they're owned by Walmart. And their business was in terrible trouble until they went out and talked to consumers and did panels and had voting and took a scientific method to figuring out what their consumers wanted in the marketplace. They canned all of their private label items and started over and rebuilt the entire line and relaunched it. They relaunched it and the results are that they stopped their decline and now are rebuilding the business um, after, you know, after uh, 11, 12 quarters of decline. Now they're back on track. So they put down the hubris, they, they, they put down the pride, embrace sincerity, and are heading in the right direction. Great example. The second sin is, is price envy. And again, we have seen this play out um, multiple times. Uh, one of the great examples was when Ron Johnson from um, Apple came in to run J.C. Penney and he stopped all the promotions and, and figured that J.C. Penney was going to be like Apple and just deliver one product, um, I mean one proposition, um, pricing, you know, with, with, uh, with no promotion, no sales and all that and, you know, 
almost killed J.C. Penney, which was heading out. They, he believed that, that he didn't have to compete with the department stores. Um, we see, again, we see this play out in the private label business, the private brands business in North America, where in the 60s and 70s, private label was really generic product, so it's cheaper product, cheaper quality at a cheaper price. And then it moved into what's, what was called the emulation phase of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. So it was the same or similar quality as national brands at a lower price. But now we see a new revolution happening in private brands where many of the private brands are better quality than the national brand at the same price as the national brand or slightly lower. So the days of, uh, the days of confusing price with value are ending. Um, there's, there is no more undercut, cut, skimp on quality and undercut on price in order to drive more business. It's now about converting your thinking from price into value. Um, we saw a, uh, we did a survey last month the, and we found that over 60% of shoppers have increased their private brand purchases over the last two years. That is not because the private brand pricing has come down. And actually, private brand pricing on average has gone up. That's because the quality and the value perceptions have gone up. I'll give you another great example, again, back to, to, to Walmart. Walmart had a very cheap line of products called Price First. Um, very few benefits, meant to be the cheapest on the shelf, period, over and out. But then they bought Jet.com. Jet.com launched uh, Uniquely J, which is their line of private brands, at much higher quality um, uh, and a much better value. And consumers are going crazy over this new line of products, um, if, if you believe Twitter. So, um, and, and uh, we can talk about that uh, separately, but at least in the retail world, I believe Twitter that the consumers are telling us the truth. These tweets are not fake news. Um, I'm obsessed with the quality and the brand of, of uh, Uniquely J. Um, you know, excited to try this product, uh, want to share this with, with everyone. So they have found a way um, to, uh, to raise the bar on quality and not compete on price. Um, their head of private label um, at Jet.com said, quote, um, uh, Jet wants to eliminate the trade-offs that consumers face. The purchase decision becomes an easy one when each product offers the trifecta of quality, style, and value. So it's all three, right? So we, again, we espouse to the, the, um, the nature of, of being grateful um, for what's going on. Another example really is um, uh, at Kroger, and we all know Kroger's Simple Truth line, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but their, their, their pet food line called Abound is an incredibly high quality product um, at, at Kroger, and it has all of the quality as the super premium products. Uh, it compares directly with Imes and, and Nutro and Purina One uh, and all. And what Kroger has found, again, as their consumers change how they think about price and value, um, Kroger can move, up that, can move up that food chain as well. So, um, so price envy does not work. The third sin is what we call national brand wrath. And so what I'll tell you what this really means is um, competitiveness to then be blind to what's going on in the, in the market. So we all know the battles of Coke versus Pepsi. We know the battles of Sam's versus Costco, Nike versus Reebok, McDonald's versus Burger King, Hertz versus Avis, Procter & Gamble versus Unilever, Visa versus MasterCard, 
CVS versus Walgreens. All of this competitive, competitiveness, though, can lead those competitors to be distracted and miss the disruption that's happening around them and to them. So if you're too busy focused on who you're competing with, again, you're missing what the consumers want, allowing disruption. Did, did Gillette ever think the Dollar Shave Club was going to come in and, and be successful up against Gillette? Of course not. And then Unilever buys Dollar Shave Club for almost a billion dollars. Not only that, another startup company, Harry's, I don't know if you all have seen, but if you, you know, they started the same way in the e-commerce space. Now, if you go into Target's, Harry's has in-cap displays with all their items. Both Harry's and Dollar Shave Club, good items. Gillette, what is Gillette doing now? Gillette's having to reduce their price. So the, the direct competitiveness is distracting. Um, we've, seen, we've seen national brands outspending products, but, um, but not working with the private brands and working with the retailers. So um, we would say that we, want, we would espouse that there be patience and cooperation in this space rather than direct competition. The national brands who believe, um, in my world, the national brands who believe that private label is a competitor are, are going to be out of luck because retailers need private label to be successful. The national brands who are working with the retailers who we work with to build out programs um, with the national brand and private label will succeed. That's as simple as that. We think there will be a heightened level of cooperation rather than, um, you know, rather than uh, brand wrath. We see that brands will create win-win situations and solutions across their competitive set, across their categories, in order to win in the future. The next sin, sin number four, is the sin called quality lust. And if you under-deliver on quality these days, you go bust, as we all have seen, as we've seen the struggles of companies like Chipotle and all that have really struggled um, and have taken a beating, you cannot undercut quality. It used to be that, that reducing quality, holding price was a way of success. Um, or even reducing package size and holding price um, helped you succeed. Today, consumers are so smart, they see through that, um, and the bar is being raised. I'll give you an example. So you all know the German retailer Lidl, um, incredibly successful around the world. They've come into the United States, mainly in the mid-Atlantic, but with a big appetite to spread way beyond the mid-Atlantic, and introduced 90% of their items, 80% of their items, 90% of their items are private brands. So we went in, um, Damon went in and bought all the items in their stores and tested all their items. What, we, what we've discovered is two things. One is their store traffic is not where they want it to be. They've already fired the first C, the, the first and second CEO of this division and hired the third one because the store traffic isn't where they want it to be. And why is that? Why are they having a hard time with the startup? Their stores are pretty nice if you've been in them. The quality of their products is not up to standard. It is not acceptable to the shoppers that are out there. They're shorting on weight. Um, they're playing games with package sizes. The product quality is inconsistent. Some of the products have very little appeal. They rushed to market and didn't put together a great proposition. And again, Twitter says, Lidl is selling literal trash avocados and the millennials shall suffer. So that's not a good way to start out a business. Now, the Lidl folks are smart. 
of course, and they will figure it out, but they've set a bad tone um, to get off the blocks with. And if they think that they're gonna catch up with Aldi and build out you know, 2,000 stores over the next four years on this proposition by cutting corners, it will not work. They've got to fix their product quality. Um, and so, you know, we espouse to obviously um, having some chastity, um, having some inspiration around product quality. And we've seen that with Lidl's direct competitor, Aldi. And so for, for those of you who don't go into Aldi's very much um, or who haven't been into one lately, I would strongly recommend that you go in and, and look around. They have changed over their entire product line over the last six years. They have upgraded the quality of every single product in the store. They've embraced the clean labels. They've embraced what true natural is. They've embraced raising the quality of their products, and it is impressive. The other thing they've done, which is really impressive, is they've trained their people on what they've done and how they've raised the bar on quality. So their store associates, and there are not many of them in their stores, but the store associates are very well trained on their products and, and the recipes that you can use and which products to buy. Um, they won, this uh, last year, they won over 200 awards on the, on the quality of the products that they represent. So thinking that you can get by with average quality, with the quality that worked last year, five years ago, to your consumers going forward will not work, truly. The other example that I'll give you is Kroger's Simple Truth. Kroger's Simple Truth business is a private label I will tell you that Kroger's Simple Truth, the diagnostics that we've done on that private label business show that it has more brand affinity, more consumer appeal than national brands. The loyalty to Simple Truth, the, the consumers who believe in that brand, um, believe in it more than they believe in the national brands. There are 1,400 SKUs of Simple Truth throughout the Kroger store. 1,400, incredibly impressive. If Simple Truth were listed on the, um, on the um, you know, Fortune 500, Simple Truth would rank as the 127th largest corporation on the Fortune 500. It is a damn big business. Why is that? Because they believe in the quality of the product and delivering the quality of the product. Truly inspirational. The fifth, and probably the one nearest and dearest to everyone in this room's heart, is the margin greed. So how do I make more money? How do I boost my margins? How do I cut corners? How do I reduce the package size? How do I um, promise that this product is as good as organic or, or quote unquote natural um, to maintain my margins. And the real sin in this margin greed is the sin of not reinvesting in the business. Because man, there are lots of people out there disrupting retailers and manufacturers that are investing. Um, if, 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 if you're holding your margin in order and then you're cutting R&D, which we've seen a lot, cutting quality, um, uh, holding prices, cutting marketing, which we've all seen, then what you're doing is you're managing the bottom line and you're killing the top line. And that is going to, um, that is going to you know, continue. And consumers are smart and they figure it out. So, you know, CVS, um, just had a, 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 an example of this where they were caught, caught is maybe not the right word, um, they were found to be overcharging for generic drugs. So you could buy generic drugs at other places or at CVS if you didn't use your health care plan than you could if you were using your health care plan there. Um, and they're making a killing off of, off of selling generics, but at what cost? 
They got caught. It was exposed on maybe not 60 Minutes, but on Dateline, um, you know, kind of scandalous. They were trying to protect their margins, and in fact, they got, they got busted for, um, for doing that. We see, uh, we see other retailers doing the same thing. Um, you know, Whole Foods is now, um, if you all saw the Washington Post article about Whole Foods putting the squeeze, especially on the smaller, um, smaller vendors, you know, what's interesting is Amazon owns Whole Foods, Jeff Bezos also owns Washington Post. The Washington Post is the one who did the expose on Whole Foods. So I guess there is, I guess there is um, some truth and integrity in, in the press. Um, but what Whole, Foods is what, what Whole Foods is doing is they're raising the bar over all of their vendors that they've got to deliver. They've got to be there on time. They've got to raise their quality. They've got to provide services. They've got to sharpen their pencils and all. That's not, that's not for Whole Foods to protect its margin, but that's for Whole Foods to appeal to the consumer. We've also seen it with Walmart leaning on vendors. Walmart has just rolled out a program this year where if you don't deliver the product on time and complete, um, you as a vendor, you will get penalized, you will get fined. And so, again, they're raising the bar. They're trying to protect their margins, obviously, but more importantly, they're trying to deliver um, the right proposition to the consumer. A total separate example, which I find very fascinating, the Damon ran, a, a retailer told us that they thought that um, the national brand uh, providing coffee creamers was making way too much money. And I will tell you the powdered coffee creamer margin is very high on national brands. It is like crack cocaine, um, extraordinarily high. So the retailer said, what do we do about this? They proposed and we helped them build out a line of private brands to compete with, the, with, the, with this non-dairy creamer, the national brand. And then the retailer had an interesting idea. Take out all of the national brand SKUs of coffee creamer. Kill the category, take, take them all out and only sell our private brand. So we ran the test. We took out all of the national brands because they were being greedy with their margins. We put in private brand that was a high quality at a good price. You know what happened? Sales went up and the retailer margin went up for that category. So if you're a national brand and you're trying to you know, gouge the consumer, overprice, take too much advantage, take too much margin, uh, the retailers are gonna teach you a lesson. And for your sales to go from whatever it was in the category to zero is a very tough lesson to learn. Um, I came from the breakfast cereal um, category industry. Private label in breakfast cereal sells for between eight and 12 cents an ounce. Branded products sell between 20 and 30 cents an ounce. Unbelievable price disparity. Why do you think that is? Well, that's because folks like Kellogg's and General Mills make a ton of dough out of breakfast cereal and are milking the business. Why do you think the breakfast cereal business industry category has been declining for the last 15 or 20 years? Obviously, health has something to do with it, um, but it's also that the, that the pricing is way out of, out of whack. So again, the, the, the margins um, have got to equilibrate. There is a way to be generous. And who does this really well? Obviously, Costco um, is viewed as being generous on pricing, generous on margins. They only upcharge brands 8%. They make all their money on the fee that they charge, right? And so they can afford to under, underprice or value price the products. They do an incredibly good job. Um, I will say that, you know, Amazon doesn't make any margin uh, in, on their, on their e-commerce side, on their branded side. So what are they going to do about it? Well, they're going to launch, and they are already, um, lines of private brands where they can make the margin 
rather than uh, the national brands. So as a national brand, how do you compete with that? Well, you can't be, you can't be greedy around your margin, that's for sure. You've got to figure out how to, how to provide more generosity. The sixth sin is promotion gluttony. And we've all seen this, over-promote, more and more promotion. If, if, you walk through a, if you walk through your favorite drugstore and go to the OTC section, or even your favorite grocer, go to the, the pharmacy section, the OTC section, you will see nothing on the shelf because all the products are covered by all of those damn tags that are up there on every single SKU with some sort of promotional offer. Unbelievable. We're seeing that more and more. There is more price promotion. There are more artificial prices out there. The amount of trade dealing in the industry has gone up and up and up in order to buy the business. Um, one, of the great, uh, one of the great examples uh, that, that cracks me up, for those of you who shop at CVS, and I do, every time you buy a product, what happens? You get um, well, first you have to wait for five minutes for the card reader to read your chip. And then they print off the receipt. And then what happens? They print a string of coupons that goes four and five feet long. The, one of the favorite Halloween costumes this year was being a CVS Promotional cash register receipt. There, there are pictures all over Facebook and social media of people draped in all of these coupons and promotions. So much so that when you walk out of the store and you've got four feet of offers, what do you do? You can't possibly look at all of them and, and evaluate all of them. It is, I'm sorry to say, too much of a good thing. The answer, obviously, is temperance. And so how do you get away from over-promoting every single category? Well, we've seen a great example um, coming out of, of a, a British chain called Weight Rose. And the way they do it is they say, you pick your offers. So you go through and you do your shopping, and then we're going to let you have X number of products that you're buying have a discount on them. So you decide what you want the discount applied to. We're not going to do it for you. We won't promote the items. We'll let you pick. And in, what a great way to build some affinity with the, with, with the shopper. Um, the, 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 the Lidl stores in the UK have done the same thing. On a promotion basis, they let shoppers set the price for certain categories. So they'll announce um, this week, we're looking for, you know, how much should we charge on these items? And the more tweets that they get out, the more social media responses that they get out, the price goes down and down and down. So they did, before the holidays, um, you know, uh, fresh lobsters that dropped from $5.99 a pound to $2.99 a pound based on the responses from the consumers. It gave the consumers some engagement in the promotion. So it wasn't just promoting items that you want to sell. It was engaging with consumers on the items that they want to buy. That is a big shift that's going on in the marketplace. And then the seventh and final sin is assortment sloth. And you all know this. You've seen this everywhere. Stale categories. Um, how, many, how many different types of nut butter do you need in the category? How many varieties of canned peas uh, in the category? Uh, how, how little do I have to change um, the category? And you know, there are a bunch of examples, examples about this. Um, we see, for example, at Target, their struggle in the grocery business. Uh, they've tried to get in the grocery business, and it hasn't worked for them. They've built out, you know, the, the little section, the big sections, carrying food items and, and uh, um, detergents and all. 
and they're, they're, it hasn't worked for them. I mean, they're, they're not getting the store trafficked. What do they do? What did they do wrong? Well, they carried the same items that everyone else was carrying. There was no uniqueness to, to target getting into the grocery business. Never drove any traffic, any incremental traffic. So now what they're doing is they're, they're quote unquote working on a differentiated experience in food and beverage. This is round four for them to figure this out. Um, and you all know, those of you who are uh, manufacturers out there, you know they've turned over their head of merchandising several times. Now, the CEO of Target, Brian Cornell, is a very smart guy, and I think he'll figure it out. Um, you know, we believe that what Target really should do is just let Trader Joe's come in and put their stores in the Target space. That would be differentiating. And by the way, the footprint is the same. So Target could put in Trader Joe's and make a very differentiated experience. We'll see, you know, if they do that. Um, we also say don't be late to the game, so prune very quickly, um, add very quickly. Um, you know, a great example is the Albertson store chains out west. Um, they just in 2017 launched their own private brand Greek yogurt. So just as Greek yogurt is sort of peaked and all, they're now getting into that business. I would say that's, that's pretty slothful to move that slowly. They gotta figure it out. Meanwhile, at, at Trader Joe's again, what are they doing? Well, they're launching the next new thing. Wait for it, Icelandic yogurt. It's killer. And actually, it really is. Um, what it is, I don't know, but it is, it is delicious. Um, and that, you know, they're good at curating their assortment. You know, you, if, if, if you've spent any time in Trader Joe's, they are very meticulous about what they sell and what they don't sell. Um, Whole Foods is going through the same exact thing. They are culling out lots of products that they do not need and then dialing up the quality of the products that they are offering. In the, in the assortment world, I'll give you an old case study, an old um, psych, uh, psychological study that was conducted 20 years ago with um, jams. So they did a, they did a study, um, some psychologists, and they showed people uh, a table with 24 jams on the table and asked them to try two. And then they did another subset where they showed people only six flavors of jams and asked them to try two. What they found, this is interesting, what they found is more people were attracted to the table with 24 jams than were to the table with only six jams. There was great appeal in looking at the variety, much greater appeal. However, and, and that's the curse that we've been living through with all these categories that have more and more SKUs. However, what they've really found in that study is the purchase intent. So of the people who looked at the 24 jams, only 3% were interested in buying one of the jams. Of the people who looked at the six jams, 30% were interested in buying. 3% versus 30%. Why is that? That is the paradox of choice. If you will make it easier for me, if you will curate for me what I have to choose, I will be more likely to choose. I'll never forget um, back in the day when I would go into Blockbuster Video, many of you remember those stores, and walk out with no video because I couldn't make a decision on what to rent. And then along came Redbox and there were only a few choices and so I would make it easier for me. Well, that's what's going on in, in retailing today. We as retailers are helping to curate that choice and manufacturers new, need to do the same. The proliferation is not working. The curation will work. Um, 
So those are, those are the, um, sorry, those are the seven deadly sins. So sin number one, pride, what we say is you've got to be more sincere. Sin number two, price, we say you've got to really focus on the value offered to the consumer. Easy to say, hard to do. Sin number three, the brand versus brand competitive wrath, we say you've got to figure out how to differentiate, and in differentiation, that means collaboration. Sin number four, quality lust, we say quality delivered and quality inspired. Sin number five, margin greed, and what we say is margin that supports the top line, not the bottom line. Sin number six, promotion gluttony, we say don't promote, engage. Get true engagement. And then sin number seven, assortment sloth, we say you've got to curate. So those are the seven deadly sins and the redemption that, that, that we offer. We don't believe it's too late. We believe these seven sins are mainly self-inflicted, and we believe that with an adjustment in approach, um, the, they are easily overcome. So I ask that you um, provide feedback, and um, when you give feedback, you'll also give water to um, those who need it, um, even in countries that Donald Trump doesn't like. So, um, so thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions if you all would like. Or I'll stick around if you want to just come up and, and uh, ask me afterwards. But thank you all.